If you have your Bibles, <clears throat> would you turn to Luke, the fifth chapter? We're continuing our series <clears throat> entitled, Who's Your One? Two weeks ago, we've been, we talked about the importance of one. You know how, like, in this, in this life, if you go out after church and you go get dessert and they bring you just like one cookie or one piece of cake, you're probably thinking, oh, that's, that's not a lot. But you go over to a third world country, that's a lot. They, they would give their left arm to have just one nice piece of cake. And in America, we talked about it this morning, we're spoiled. Man, I, how many of y'all have ever been on a cruise? Raise your hand if you've been on a cruise. Man, like after the first couple days on the cruise, so like I, I, I go and sit down at dinner, me and Beck, and we sit with this other couple, couple I think they're from, from Hungary or Poland or something, and, and we're sitting there, and, and they bring out the, 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 the meat dish, the main course, just this little piece of chicken. Like in America, we're spoiled. Like, like our meat, our protein is like half the plate. And then we get like a little salad, three carrots, a big piece of bread. But like, like I was sitting there, and I, I'm like, I can eat this thing in two bites. You know, like, have you ever played that game, Name That Tune? Like, I was playing that game, how many bites could I eat this thing in? And then I found out, like, usually they had, like, three entrees that you pick one. Well, I found out that I didn't just have to pick one, Brother Mike. I could pick all three. <laughs> and, I, and, and, and we're, like, spoiled. But these, like, these other countries, like, they, they barely get enough food. And we complain because we got one piece of cake. Or we got one breadstick today at lunch if we go eat Italian. One, one doesn't seem like it's a very big number. But can I tell you this morning the importance of one in God's economy? One is huge. Because the Bible says that when one soul gets saved, the angels in heaven rejoice. And that led me to last week we talked about the sound of heaven. That's the sound of heaven. People rejoicing. I, I believe that, that, that people that have gone on to be with Jesus already, I told you last week, I believe that in some way, shape, or form, in some fashion, I believe they kind of know what's going on on this earth. They might not know all your struggles and all your trials, but, 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 but when you have something to rejoice about, man, they're rejoicing right along. We, as Hebrews says, we have the great cloud of witnesses. And so this morning, I, I want to I talk about, we, we talked about the importance of one, and we talked about the sound of heaven for a few moments this morning. I want to talk to you about the mission of one. Say that with me. Say the mission the mission of one. I, I hope, my prayer, this preacher's prayer, I, I pray over you. I pray over you um, when I'm doing my sermon prep. I pray over you when I'm in the church by myself. I pray over you when I pull in the parking lot in the morning. I pray that these parking lot would be filled, and, and I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to you. And, and I pray today as we speak and as, as we share and as we unpack this message today, I, I pray that you would, you, you would get on board. I pray that you would get on mission. And I pray that God would reveal to you that one that you would go fishing for. I heard this quote this week as I was preparing, and it went a little something like this, that, that, and I'm giving you the short version. It said, in, in our culture today, we are really passionate about movements. In other words, we're really passionate about, whenever there's a cause, we're very passionate about getting behind that cause, if it's, if it's a cause that we are, are, are in agreement with, right? And then if it's a cause that we're not in agreement with, we're passionate about getting behind not getting behind <laughs> that movement, right? In our culture, we're good about those things. We, we love the idea of being involved and being involved in big things and grandiose things. Um, we love in our culture today being part of something great, don't we? You know, there, there, there's a lot of folks that love, and I want to bring it down to where we live. We, we love, and we would love to be a part, and I think we are a, a part of a church that's doing great things for the kingdom of God. And, and there's a lot of people that like being a part of churches that are doing a big, great service for the kingdom of God, but in reality, they're really not being a part because they're just sitting there taking up space. Amen? Are, are you with me this morning? Um, and it's easy to say we like being a part of something great. But, but here's where the push comes to the shove. We say that we like to be a part of big things and great things, but are we really using our special and unique God-given gifts, talents, and abilities to jump in and actually help that thing 
or that church or that cause or that thing that we want to be a part of that's great, are we actually being a positive influence on helping that thing to be great? Amen? I, I hear people all the time, I've been in ministry, I'm, I'm 46 years old, I've been in ministry in some shape or form since I was 17 years old, and, and, and I've been around the church, and people say, well, I wish the church would do this, or I wish the church would do that, or I just wish the community would do this, or I just wish the community would do that. Well, guess what? Instead of sitting on the sidelines and wishing and hoping and begging and, and, and gossiping and talking bad about it, why don't you jump in and get involved and be a part of something great? Amen? I, 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 I was sitting in my office on, on Friday for a little bit, and then yesterday... And I want to turn my attention to the big idea this morning. This thing hit me like a ton of bricks. Listen to this. The idea of missions is different from our personal role in the mission. I, I want to say that again because, because that just went over some of y'all's head. Our ideals about what mission is is different from our actual personal role, or let me say personal involvement in mission. C can I bring it down like this? And, and I want to use Zachary as, as an illustration this morning. And, and I'm wearing my ORU shirt, even though I didn't. I, I need to get a Mid-America one of these, because that's actually where I graduated from. But I got this just so I can support Zachary and the ORU go folks. But, but listen, I, I want to bring it home like this. So, it's different. There's a difference between Zachary sitting up at ORU in a missions class. <laughs> this is the idea of missions. This is where we can mission. This is how much it costs for missions. Right? This is what you do on mission trips. But it's a whole new ball game. He's, he had this idea being a part of a team. But that idea being a part of a team changed when he actually got on the plane and popped himself right down in Tanzania where he's at right now working at this very moment transporting over what 2,000 pounds of building material into the forest with a team of six seven eight ten whatever it is to build churches for people that actually want to go to church <laughs> That, that you don't have to beg and prod and Facebook announcements and Facebook invites and put a dog and pony show to get people to come to church. They actually want to go. His idea changed. He's seeing a whole different pers watch, perspective. There was a shift. And, and, and friends, this morning we have to have a shift that our idea of what the mission is it becomes a whole lot different because we actually get involved. I'm afraid that, that in the church we're really good about cheerleading. Getting our paw palms and, and say, yeah, pastor, I'll give to the outreach program. Oh, because, because in the United States it's easy for us to write a check. And I thank God for your checks. Keep writing them. <laughs> but, uh, but, but it's a lot easier to write a check. We, can, can I tell you what the problem is in the American church? We want staff to do everything. We want to hire staff. It's the pastor's job. It's the children's pastor's job. It's the youth pastor's job. Well, guess what? If you don't bring your youth here, the person in charge of youth can't minister to them. If you don't bring your kids here, well, I would just wish my kids would have a foundation in Jesus. Well, you keep them home. And you don't bring them to the house of God. And you wonder why they're screwed up. Because you're not raising them, and you're not bringing them to the church to help the church supplement them and raise them. It's not the church's job only. And we get on the sidelines, throw our pom-poms hand up in the air, while everybody else is hard at work on the front lines. I'm hoping today we'd stop being cheerleaders and we put on, replace our pom poms with work gloves and we'd be afraid to get dirty. It's all, it's all right to get dirty for the kingdom of God. It's okay to get grease on our hands. It's okay, ladies, for your, for your eye shadow to, to smear a little bit because you, you've been crying over souls. Hello, am I in the, are you in the building with me this morning? 
I, I, feel, I feel like I'm preaching pretty good so far. Gospel of Luke chapter 5, I want to read, starting in verse <clears throat> number, number 17, I think. Luke chapter 5. Not Luke 15. Luke 5. I was in Luke 15. Luke chapter 5. Here, here we go. Verse 17. On one of those days, while Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there and had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and also from Jerusalem, and the Lord's power to heal was in him, meaning was in Jesus. Verse 18. Here's my, here's my main text today. Just then, some men came carrying on a stretcher a man who was paralyzed. You know what that means? He couldn't walk. He couldn't help, help himself. He couldn't get up himself. They tried to bring him into the house and set him down before Jesus. Verse 19, since they could not find a way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and they lowered him on the stretcher through the roof tiles in the middle of the crowd before Jesus. Verse 20, seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Then the scribes and the Pharisees began to think to themselves, who's this man who speaks blasphemies? Who forgives sins but God? But perceiving the thoughts, Jesus replied to them. By the way, you know what Jesus knows your thoughts. <laughs> Amen. Before you even say it, he knows it, so you might as well not even think it before you say it. Why are you thinking this in your heart? Which is either to say your sins are forgiven or say get up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man, I love what Jesus did. So the Son of Man has authority so that you're going to know, Mr. Pharisee. <laughs> this is what I'm going to say. He told the paralyzed man, get up. Take your stretcher, take your mat and go home. Verse 25, immediately he got up before them, picked it up what he'd been lying on, and went home glorifying God. Then everyone was astounded. They were giving glory to God. They were filled with awe, saying, we have seen incredible things today. This morning, I'm going to share with you four things, I guess. Four things. That's what I got. Four things. The first is this. Each one of us must be on mission. When you look at verse 19, man, these guys, they had a mission. And the mission was to get this guy to Jesus. Are you tracking with me? Are you seeing this? And, and, and mission, listen, minute, mission, what, what do I mean by mission? Mission helps define who we are. Mission helps define not just who we are, but mission helps define what we do. Mission gives us direction. Mission gives us directions in our life. Mission gives us directions to our families. Mission gives us directions at our job and our culture. We, why, why do your job, whether you know it or not, has a mission statement. Those of you that work in the school, your mission statement is to help kids get educated, right? If you build stuff, here's the mission. If your work builds stuff, here's the mission. Build it so good that it don't fall apart. Hey, Amen? Like, that, that's the mission. Like, like, did you know, how many of you have Facebook? You know what Facebook started out as? It's a media platform for your grandma to keep up with their grandchildren. Did you know that? You know what Instagram, how many of you have Instagram? It's to capture and share the world's moments. Did you know our church has a mission? And I hope you know it. Our church's mission is to help people big, live big lives for Jesus. And how do we do that? Through our core values of giving big and loving big and committing big and serving big and dreaming big. And guess what? Here, here at this church, it's all about Jesus. When we lose our focus about not, uh, why we do things, if our focus is we're not doing things because it's about Jesus, watch this, if we do things because we're trying to satisfy the biggest givers in the church, then we're doing things for the wrong reason. If we're trying to make church decisions because we're afraid to lose people, then we're doing it for the wrong decision and the wrong reason. But if we're doing it for Jesus, that's why we should be doing it. Guess what? Amen? Jesus himself had a mission statement. Luke 19, 10. If you want to know why Jesus came, Jesus said the Son of Man has come to seek and to save. That's what was lost. Guess what? God is involved in, in, in the business of finding lost people. And guess what? If Jesus is in us, and if Jesus is in the church, guess what our job is? It's about the lost. We, 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 we listen, listen. We got a problem in the church. The church is we have ceased to care. I'm preaching bold. We have ceased to care about lost people, and we have become keepers of the aquarium. 
As long as the aquarium looks nice, as long as the aquarium smells nice, as long as everybody is happy, as long as everybody's got their needs met, guess what? The church isn't about getting your needs met. The church is to bring you to the foot of Jesus and the foot of the cross. To seek lost people. And listen, verse 10. That's what Jesus said in Luke 19.10. But going back to our text, here's the mission. To bring the paralyzed man to Jesus. What's the mission? What was the mission of these guys? To see the man walk. Like that was their goal. Like that's their end game. Why did they drag this dude to the house and get involved? Because it would have been better just to stay at home because they didn't have to work. Like the dude couldn't walk. Like he couldn't help himself. In other words, they actually had to put some effort in. Like how are we going to get there? How are we going to get them there? Are we going to use a donkey? Are we going to use a cow? Are we going to use a chariot? Are we going to steal a Roman chariot? What, what are we going to do? They had to put in the work. That was their mission. Let, let, listen, that desire to see this man walk again, a man that hadn't walked for we don't know how many years, it moved them. Hello. It was their driving passion. That they were willing to do whatever it takes to see this man walk. I, I don't know about you, but, but I grew up on Popeye. And, and, and we, these guys, they had a Popeye moment. What is Popeye? When, when he's trying to save olive oil and, and Brutus gets, gets involved and, and all this stuff, guess what? You know, and I wrote it down because I wanted to, to say it right. He said, I've had all that I can stand until I can't stand no more. And then he goes to the cupboard and he gets the spinach and he eats the spinach and then muscles come up and he goes and he takes care of business. Friends, this morning we have to take and we have to have all that we could stand for what hell has done and what the enemy has done in our world and in our life. The enemy has destroyed souls and has destroyed our families and we need to get to a point that we can't stand it no more. And have a Popeye moment and say, I'm going to do whatever it takes to drag people kicking and screaming through the blood of Jesus. What, what, listen, what moves you? Is it just about good things? It's about a job that provides for you, provides for your family because you want to provide for your kids and all that. All that stuff's great. But let me ask you this. What spiritually drives you? Serious question. How many of you, when you pull into the parking lot or on the way to church, are actually praying for somebody to have a divine moment with Jesus on that Sunday morning? Like when you're sitting there singing the songs, or are you just thinking, oh, it's too loud, or it's too soft, or it's not my favorite song? Or are you engaged and saying, God, I pray that this song would move somebody, even though it might not be my favorite, even though it's not as old as I want it to be, God? I want to pray because I always say this you know, song touches somebody. That's what it's about. And you younger folks that, that only like the newer stuff, are you stay when we sing that that hymn and like, well, man, uh, I don't even know that one anymore. But if it blesses somebody that's older, God bless them because they were the foundation of this church. We need to honor and respect the heritage and the culture. Amen. What moves you? What kingdom dreams do you have? What things in your life are you thinking about? Are you just thinking about living for the moment or are you living for eternity? Are you willing to help somebody come to Christ because that's what really matters for eternity? Number two, not only do we need to be on mission, but we need to have big expectations. <clears throat> the Bible says, again, verse 19, they couldn't find a way to get in because of the crowd. See, they could have just been like, oh, it's too busy. <laughs> it's too busy in here. Let's go home. Hey, buddy, we're going we're gonna to try again tomorrow. Maybe, maybe Jesus will actually come to where we are so we don't have to go where he is. Right? I want to say that again. Oh, 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 man. Oh, I, I just, man, I'm just going to sit in my home and, and I just hope Jesus comes visits me. Well, he can. Or I just hope, oh, I hope by the Spirit of God that I'm just sitting out on my lazy boy on my porch and God brings a neighbor to my past so I can witness to them. 
I'm going to sit here on my porch and watch TV and smoke barbecue ribs. Oh, but he's such a good God. He's going to bring somebody and put somebody in my path. No, no. You're supposed to go get in somebody else's path. Go take the ribs to somebody else. Like go across the street, go across the alley and knock on somebody's door and say, look, I just want to feed you some physical food. Oh, now can I tell you about my Jesus? <laughs> Amen. Some of y'all getting hungry for some ribs right now, aren't you? We have to have big expectations. Listen, the guys just didn't stop, but they said, we're going to press through the crowd. We can't get in the doorway. We're going to go up and over. Because they expected God to move. They had a mission. They just didn't have a mission, but they had an expectation that God was going to do a miracle. And can I tell you that God is still the God of miracles. I, I'm, I'm preaching like an old-time preacher today. God is still a God of miracles. But before we get the miracle, we have to be willing to take the risk. You know what the risk is? You, they, didn't have a, they didn't have a lift to lift him up the roof. They didn't have a crane to take that guy on his stretcher up on the roof. Are you with me? It was risky. They didn't, they didn't have the, 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 all that stuff that we got today to keep us safe when we're climbing mountains. But they said, you know what? If this guy's going to get healed, we're going to have to find a way to get to Jesus. And if it means going up on the roof, somebody's going to push him up, somebody's going to hold him up, and somebody's going to drag him up. And then, and then they get him up there. And here, I think the hardest part was not just getting him up there. I think the hardest part was lower him down. Don't drop him on Jesus' head. If you drop him on the master's head, he can't be healed. It takes risk. I think, a, I think the Bible, all throughout the Bible, we, we, we have risk. I think about the children of Israel in Joshua chapter 1. Moses led him out of the Egyptian bondage, and he passes the baton to Joshua. He says, go into the promised land. In the book of Joshua, before they entered the promised land, one of the first places they had to go through was Jericho, a big walled city. And, and I, listen, listen to God's military strategy. For those of you guys that were in the military, this is absolutely terrible strategy. He said, I, I want you to invade Jericho, but I, want, I don't want you to take a bow and arrow. I don't want you to take bazookas. I don't want you to take tanks. I don't want you to take fire. Here's your, here's your military strategy. I want you to scream. <laughs> what? what, God? You brought us all the way here to scream? <laughs> God said, yep. Walk around it for seven days. The first six times, I want you just to not say nothing. But the seventh time around, on the seventh day, I want you to yell at the top of your lungs. What a great strategy. Man, the whole board's fired for that one. I, but it worked. I think about three guys, Daniel, in the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar turned the fire up hot, King Nebi. And these three guys, they said, okay, here's, here's, what, here's what the deal is. We're not going to bend and bow. You can turn it up however hot you want. God is going to be our deliverer. And even if he's not, even if he doesn't deliver, he's still going to be my God. I'm going to continue to bend and bow to King, King Jesus and not King Nebi and not your statue. And guess what? It took risk. I've been like, oh, how hot, how hot is hot? It's not going to feel very good. Can, can we just do it one more time? How many, that, that, how many would that be us? I mean, we're just being honest here. We're, but, but you know what? They, they stood strong. And, and then as they were standing strong, guess what happened? The King Nebi said, to his military generals, hey, hey, I thought we just put three uh, in the fire, but there's a fourth walking around. Nah, 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 walking around. Somebody get up on the Hammond B3 organ. But I see a fourth uh, walking, and he looks like the Son of God. Can, can I just tell you something? Jesus just didn't come on the scene in Matthew chapter number one. He was on the scene in the beginning. God said, let us make man in our own image. And he was on the scene in the book of Daniel walking in the fire and guess what when you take risk he will walk in the fire with you amen church and they went up on the top of the roof oh oh lord this see most of us be like oh lord this must be a closed door 
God's closing the door, so he must... No! He wasn't closing the door. He was giving them an opportunity, listen, to exercise their faith, to understand that, see, if they just did it on their own, if they just walked right in, that would have been on them. But they exercised their faith and said, guess what? It's not on us. It's on them. Now, the gospel moves us forward. So the men kept moving forward. Now here's the deal. The third thing. And I kind of already touched on it. Not only do we have to be on mission and have big expectations, but we need to understand that when we do anything for God, obstacles will happen. I've been living obstacles since November. <laughs> you know? Surgeries and medications and everything. Can, can, can I tell you why the devil's been fighting so hard? Because you're here. And because he knew that on May 21st that this church would be almost full and he's fighting and he doesn't want it to happen. So guess what? He wants to take out the leadership. He wants to take out the head. He wants to wear us out. But guess what? It's a prime opportunity for the church to step up. Amen? We're going to have obstacles. They couldn't get in because of the crowd. Man, all these things ha happen in our life. There's things that happen. And, and we're like, oh man, may maybe God, maybe you're not really... Maybe that's not the one person you want me to go, go to because we get busy. We think God closed the door. See, a lot of us just want to walk through the doors God gives us when it's easy. But guess what? True Christianity is, is listen, is being faithful. Say the word Faithful. God wants faithfulness in our life and in our, in our, in our relationships, in the church, in our jobs and in marriages. God wants faithfulness. Listen, I think, I think about the Apostle Paul. Man, if it would have been easy for the Apostle Paul, it wasn't easy. But yet over two-thirds in the New Testament, we attributed to Apostle Paul. This was a guy that was flogged and beaten, thrown in prison, shipwrecked. Does that sound like an open door to you? In our culture today, Paul would have been like, God's really shutting the door. But no, he's like, beat me again. Imprison me again. And most of these letters that we have to the, to the churches, he's in prison, in a cold, dark, damp prison, in the innermost cell, and, and he's writing. Listen, he's in, in the book of Ephesians. Like, that's the letter of joy. And it wasn't joyful in his surroundings. He had obstacles. Sometimes there's a closed door. But if there's a closed door, sometimes you need to get up on the roof and dig a hole in the roof. Are you with me? Sometimes you just got to kick the door open. Because it's not Jesus closing the door. It's somebody else closing the door. Sometimes it's, it's the enemy closing the door. And you need to take your big size 12, that's me by the way, and, and, and you need to kick that door square right in the center and go marching for Jesus. Amen? Listen, coming to Christ isn't easy. Following Christ isn't easy. Those of you guys that made decisions for Christ recently, it's not easy. It's hard. If it was hard, easy, everybody would do it. If it was all about blessings, everybody would do it. But guess what? It's work. Because we have an enemy. Satan doesn't want us to win and succeed. We have to be on mission. We have to have big expectations. We understand there's obstacles. My fourth one, I'm closing. Get Well, almost. We have to prepare for God to do more than expected. Oh, I should have got a better reaction than that. We need to prepare for God to do more than expected. Look at verse 20. <clears throat> Seeing their faith, Jesus said, friend, your sins are forgiven. I, don't, don't, don't miss this. These guys got more than they bargained for, Pastor Bill. Man, their expectation was that this guy was going to go walk again. But Jesus was more involved in the greater mission. And that was the mission of his soul. Because, listen, if the man didn't come to relationship with Jesus, so what if he would walk again? He would have just walked away from Jesus. Remember many of the, in the New Testament that Jesus healed? Remember the lepers, all the lepers he healed? Only one came back and said, thank you, Jesus. The other nine just walked. Where are the nine? And that's our culture today. Where is the nine? 
find some, I've been, like I said, I've been in, in this race for so long, been a pastor for so long. Man, people come to church, pastor, 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 can you help me? Can you pray for me? Can the church come alongside of me? And we come alongside of them, and they get blessed, and then they're out. Because they think they don't need God anymore. They don't need Jesus anymore. They don't need the church anymore. And then when this church stops happening, starts, stops helping them financially or whatever, they go find another church that they can go hide in and get some money from. Well, guess what? The issues, not the money, the issues, they don't have discipline to make good decisions, a good choice. And then they blame that this church, they don't want to help us anymore, and, and they're not a really good church. They didn't help us. Stop lying. Stop, stop prophylying. That's a good one, isn't it? But God says, I'm ready to do more than expected. See, can, can, can I just tell you that, that we have an over and above and a more than enough God that he would defy our minds. Are you with me? He'd do more than enough. More than enough. And they just wanted him to be healed. They just wanted him to walk again. But I love the order of ministry here. Jesus says, I'm going to take care of your soul first because your soul is what matters for eternity. Amen. And that's what our soul is. Listen to me. The greatest need that you and I have is not eternal tweaking. I didn't say twerking. I said tweaking. Listen to me. It's not to put on a better face. It's not to cover up our flaws. We need an external tweaking in our life. Uh, uh, I'm tired of external. We don't need an external tweaking. Guess what? What we need is you and I need a heart change. We just don't need the power of positivity. We need God to get from here <clears throat> to, our, to, our, to our hearts. Are you with me? Because if God changes our hearts, then he changes our desires. He changes our earthly wants and our, our earthly flesh. We need our, listen, we need our soul crushed so God can mold us and build us up again. Some of us just need to be humbled. He's not after a tweaked life. God's after a changed life. And that's what Jesus did. Listen, the Pharisees, and, and, and I'm almost done, so hang in there. <clears throat> the Pharisees started their grumbling and complaining. <clears throat> Can I just tell you, I thank the Lord that we don't really have a lot of Pharisees here. Amen? We got some good folks here. I thank God for that. And, and ra listen, rather than these guys, these Pharisees, these religious people, rather than they celebrated that the man had an encounter with Jesus, Brother Danny, they, they, they said, who's this man who speaks the blasphemies? Who's that preacher up there? Can't believe that. Can't believe they had blue lights on the stage. Instead of purple, because purple in the, in the King James is a royal color of the tabernacle. How dare they put blue ones up? Well, guess what? They put blue ones up because it's a preacher's favorite color. So that's why they put blue up. And I have a little influence with the light crew back there. <laughs> I'm joking a little bit. But they were so busy complaining that they lost sight of the greatest miracle that could have ever happened to them. And, and, and Jesus, I love Jesus. They got more than, they got two for one. The guys took him. They expected him to walk. His soul got changed. And then he took his mat and he walked home. And look, th this, is, this is so amazing. I want you to see what here. Look, look at this last verse. He said, we have seen remarkable things. We're filled with awe. <clears throat> We've seen incredible things today. Listen to me. Listen to me. Who's the one you're going after? When will you decide to start being on the mission for Jesus? Man, you, you, know, you know what I would love to see for the rest of this year? I would love to see everybody in this church, not every family, but every person. Actually, let's start with the family. <laughs> that you would intentionally be about bringing one person to this church so that they can be saved. Amen. And, and we just might have to bust out a wall or something. 
You, can, can I tell you, I would love for you to do that so I can have a pastor's welcome class and we can have a charcuterie board after church. Is that how you say it? Charcuterie? Uh, something. We can have cheese and crackers. Ritz crackers. And spray on cheese. That's a new form of communion. Pass the cheese whiz. <laughs> Y'all, pastor, would you just close? You've lost your mind. That, that, that's really, that's community of believers right there, sharing the cheese whiz. Thank you, Jesus. But you say, well, pastor, what do I do? Well, as you stand up on your feet, I want you to listen to me this morning. Listen to this preacher. I, I'm just not all about fluff and tell you, hey, this is what you need to do, but I'm about putting some tools in your hand. When you walk out, we're, we're not rich enough as a church to have two display stands. We only got one right now. When you give more money, we'll buy another display stand so, and put it out on over there. I'm just, that's a joke, by the way. We're in a, we had to make one first to, to get a prototype, but when you leave these doors today, there's a display stand out there. A big poster. Share Jesus with somebody this week. There's two sets of invite cards for you. I'm not asking you to take a stack of ten. I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to do that. I want you to take one. Pick one of those choices of cards. I told you a couple weeks ago, spent three hours designing one of them. We need to hire a designer. We need to hire a designer. She won't look at me. She's not looking at me right now. <laughs> she's, she's praying. <laughs> she's already in prayer mode. I'm just, I love you, Kayla. I'm just playing with you. I want you to prayerfully take one of those cards. There's one that says, will you sit with me? And one says, you're invited. And I want you to take one of those cards, and I want you to prayerfully over the next three days. Whether it's in your Bible or in your wallet, probably should put it by your phone because that's what you're close to all the time. And you need to prayerfully say, God, who I, who I give this to and who I invite to church. Here's the reality, though. Can I just be honest with you? I'm a, I'm a real preacher. I need to close it down. I'm losing my voice. Some of you are like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> The reality is it's probably going to take you to invite 10 times or to ask 10 times for, that, for them to say one yes one time. Are you willing to be rejected nine times for the sake of the gospel? Paul was. I dare you to go to that person 10 times for the next 10 weeks. I want to invite you to church. Now listen, now if you know somebody that goes to another church, don't go proselytizing. And don't go trying to swap aquariums because that's evil. Can I just call that out? Evangelism is not going to another church and say, hey, come to our worship night because you're going to like our worship team a little bit better. We got too much of that going on in, in, this, in this town. And it's making me sick. Yeah. <clears throat> you know what church growth is? It's not about stealing sheep. It's about evangelizing and being on mission and winning lost people. There's enough lost sinners in Muskogee for everybody. Amen. You don't need to go to other churches and steal people. I curse that right now in the name of Jesus. I'm tired of it. Go to somebody that you know that is far from Jesus Christ. You know them. Amen. We got enough cards if everybody just take one card. Now don't take it. Use it to clean your teeth out after lunch. Put too much work in and cost too much money for that stuff. But seriously, if we really believe that Jesus changes things and Jesus changes people and that one soul is worth more than a whole world, then we will do the mission. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus.